I just wanted you to say more about um, the thing you skipped over uh, about action. Just uh, so, so is it, uh, were, was the suggestion that the importance of Dese thought was to, you know, morally exalted status, was that sort of downstream from the importance of Dese thought? To, to That's the way I did it here. I didn't actually have to do it that way. Okay. Right, so here's one thing you can't do if you're incapable of Dese thought. You can't act. Because an intention, I'm, I was assuming that action is um, somehow bound up with intention, and in, intention is essentially Dese. So you have no intentions of your own, as it were, if you're incapable of Dese thought. But you actually don't need anything that strong. Um, it comes naturally to say that at least some form of moral status comes with the capacity to um, care about how things will be with you in the future, even if you can't do anything about it because you're a clam stuck at the bottom of the ocean or something like that. If you're capable of thinking, I hope that doesn't happen to me, I hope this does, I, then you have more than a typical clam has, and that might get you into the game for exalted moral status, caring about yourself. But if you're incapable of deus thought, you can't care about yourself in that way either. Even desire of the relevant kind is essentially deus So if you're capable of the kind of experiential state that consists in wanting something and then getting it, or wanting something and then not getting it, gratification and frustration, really elemental parts of all of that presupposes deus thought. So I talked about action because that's what first occurred to me and it's a very common sort of Kantian thing to say that what makes you um, a person in the moral sense is a capacity for reflective self-control, which is the ability to deliberate in a way that inserts your agency into a stream that would otherwise be propelled forward by your impulses. You can be that kind of Kantian and accept an argument like this. These things definitely don't have that if they don't have de say thought. But you could be someone who thinks that if there's a line here, it's much lower down and just involves the capacity for future-directed concern. The fellow travelers don't have that either if they don't have... And that's the way to put it. These things do not and cannot care what happens to them. Because I can't think about themselves. And that makes them so different from us that it's at least a colorable thought that what puts us in the game for distinctive moral status they don't have. Max, will you come put the mic here? Okay, so where, where do we go? Yeah, yes. that works. So, um, I'm Max Kistler. Hi. Doesn't this debate depend a lot on the uh, metaphysical interpretation of modal statements? Um, if you um, listen, uh, if you hear um, all what you say in a fictionalist interpretation, like Armstrong combinatorialist interpretation, all these counterparts um, that are so bizarre, they are just all fictions. They exist only because we ca I can say, I can put these uh, sentences uh, together because I have the predicates. And that's all to it. So these fictions, of course, they have no moral implications. But if you have a realist interpretation, then I don't see why the counterparts don't have DC thought and why they are not uh, full persons. So all that matters for the view I was pushing is that there are de re modal truths about how you would have been affected by various courses of action that I take. You can give any analysis you like of these de re modal truths, including an Armstrong style fictionalist analysis. Um, if it matters that, you know, suppose I choose not to rescue you, so you drown. You might think it matters a great deal that you would have survived if I had rescued you. If I had rescued you. That is, whether how blameworthy I am for sitting back and watching you drown may depend on what would have happened if I had intervened. 
we can give any story we like about what makes the relevant counterfactual claim true, including an Armstrong-style analysis, but it shouldn't be that an account of modality makes the modal facts irrelevant, because after all, they're just facts about fictions. If any kind of fictionalist account of modality had that implication, that would be a serious objection to the account of modality. So I always run those arguments in the other direction, since it obviously matters what would have happened if. If the fictionalist account turns out to be correct, then it matters enormously what's so according to some fiction. Um, the idea that these things cannot think about themselves is supposed to be independent of any determinate analysis of the modal claims at issue. The idea was just supposed to be, just to put it as a simple argument, the I think a day say thought, so maybe all of my coincident objects also think that thought in the sense that they house that episode of cognition. That thought is not a thought about all of us. If it were thought about all of us, about how we will be or how we would be, then it would be indeterminate in truth value. Because some of us will be around tomorrow and some of us won't. Some of us would have been happy. Some of us would not have been happy if I had done this or that. Third premise, the de se thought isn't wildly indeterminate in truth value, so the subject term must have relatively determinate reference. The kind of, it can have some indeterminacy, but it's gotta be the kind that makes no difference to the truth value of these temporal and modal thoughts. Um, so the subject term can only refer to one thing, or one pretty massively overlapping collection of things. You then need a further claim to the effect, and moreover, it's referring to the person. I didn't really argue for that. I mean, the fact that it's unambiguous is consistent with the idea that I'm the one who never thinks about myself, as it were. But uh, that's crazy. So, conclusion, those guys never think about themselves. Thank you. So now. Uh, I'd like to continue this later. Okay. But there is Paul's question. Please come here, Paul, or others, you the way. Uh, thanks very much, Gideon, uh, for this really exciting talk. I, I have a, I guess, clarification question, more substantive question. Clarification was really about the definition of a premodal uh, property, right? Um, so it has to ground the facts about possibility. Uh, I didn't read this out, so I'll. But then you said, in worlds in which x is not f, the possibility of that f, right? So I was wondering. Couldn't you have a more even general definition of what it is to be pre-modal? So if I try to think in terms of abstract structures, I'm thinking, well, these would be what grounds the, just a distribution of, let's say, accessibility relations and uh, atomic properties in, in worlds, accessibility relations between worlds. Is, is, why is the restriction uh, in place here? or? Am I suggesting something too liberal or too... Sorry, which, which restriction? Uh, that phi grounds possibly f in worlds in which x is not f, as opposed to phi is premodal if phi grounds possibility relations and... Um, I mean, I was part... Properties at, at the various worlds. Just, I'm, as yeah, I was trying to figure out a way to say that, and I'm sure there's a more general way to say it. Okay. I mean, I, was, I wanted to leave open the view, which I in fact reject, now that I think about it, um, which says that if you're in fact f, that grounds the fact that you're possibly f. That follows from a standard possible world's account of modality. I actually think that's a mistake. I think it's not the case that you're possibly seated, because you are seated. I think that okay. at those moments where you're standing up, you're possibly seated for the same reason that you're possibly seated now. Um, namely, that your essence is consistent with the proposition that you're seated. Um, but I wanted to leave open the idea that, um, which is pretty orthodox, that 
um, P grounds possibly P. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then you don't want this to entail that every property is um, premodal, okay. because every property grounds something modal. I see that that, that is very helpful. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have another no, but I, I I'll come back to it in case because it's not unrelated. So, but please come here to, to have you on the Zoom session. For the record, I'm Daniel Rothschild. Thanks, Gideon. Um, I, yeah, I wanted to ask about, I, I'm sure this not, is not what you meant, but I was sort of in, interpreting as that, that a lot seems contingent on our self-referential practices. And you know, we in this room have quite conservative practices in that like when I, I all of us refer to self referential ourselves. But it, in a lot of the world where people believe in reincarnation, there's quite, there's much less conservative practices. That is like you can refer to yourself and then include future and past selves in that reference. Intentional. You can try to. Now you might think, okay, they fail to because they don't know which one they do, but you can imagine practices, once you accept they're all these people, you can imagine successful practices where you know you have proper, like the Dalai Lama, you have practices of choosing who your next self is and refer to it. You don't need to refer to single people. So I, I'm just worried that you know changing our practices of self-reference where me now can include not just the standard person but also past and future selves could multiply the number of morally relevant people and change the moral facts in the way you're worried about. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure that's not, that, that couldn't really be an objection to what you're doing, but I want to sort of hear what you say about why, you know, kind of the moral facts aren't hostage to self-reference practices, which could, you're, could even in like relatively near possibilities vary quite a lot. I think they, I think that's a, a real possibility. So this is a way of, um, making this connect with, um, some of Mark Johnston's older stuff on identity over time. So at one point, Johnston held that, may, it may be that as a matter of fact, we don't survive teletransportation because we are human beings and teletransportation means the end of this human animal and therefore the end of me. But now imagine a society in which everybody takes it for granted that you do survive teletransportation so they happily encourage their children to step into the teletransporter to get them to school on time and so on. Um, since in that case, there's this sort of um, effortless, direct um, self-concern that's gratified when the person who steps out on the other side of the teletransporter has a certain experience. Um, in that context, those people are teletransporter people. They survive that kind of thing, whereas we, given our self-understanding and our practices, don't. Um, I think I could take that on, I don't, haven't, I don't have a view on this, but I think I could take that on board. I didn't say anything about what it is that secures determinate reference for our first person concept um, and our first person pronouns or third person ones for that matter. Um, but if it's something to do with us and our practices, um, then it may be variable. I gotta think that there are massive limits on the ways in which it could change. It's much harder for me to imagine a setup which would lead me to think that when I think of myself, the thing I'm thinking of is one of these modally jigsaw puzzle-like things that hops around all over space and time uh, when a leaf falls from a tree. Um, but I guess if that's the right sort of view then, if it were possible for the underlying facts that secure relatively determinate reference to secure reference to one of those things, then those things would be capable of day say thought and the problem would arise. Yeah, I think that's right. Thank you. Any other question, Paul? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Ori Simkin. Um, so, uh, two questions about ethics, actually. Well, no, one about ethics, and the other is more about this, I thought. Um, so, I wanted to just uh, 
hear a little more. You, you did mention something about reference magnetism, perhaps helping with a reference to the to you, as opposed to those who co coincide with you. So I'd like to hear more because um, because um, I would have thought that um, this problem, you know, we talk about <laughs> dog parrots and so forth, but of course, once we do it just with people and happy and you know, subsequently unhappy, then it looks like everybody is equally, their, their boundaries are equally marked by natural properties or something like that, and it's very hard then to say how we can have an inegalitarian attitude when it comes to what it is that the first principles pronoun does in fact pick out. So that's, so that's question number one. Question number two, um, um, I, my understanding is that um, they say thought enters into the capacity to act, and that's the essential point. So, so um, in the in the animal rights literature, people sometimes speak of moral status as conferred by the capacity to suffer, as opposed to the capacity to act. And when it comes to suffering, yeah. it really does feel to me, at least, that um, we have to take into account those gerrymandered individuals as well, um, because they don't seem to depend so. It doesn't doesn't seem like there's such a pronounced dependence on um, something as mm -hmm. high order as they say thought. Yeah, good. So this, on the second point, um, so the phrase moral status mm -hmm. gets used in different ways. That's why I kept talking about exalted moral status. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, animals matter. They, the fact that an animal will suffer if you do this or that places constraints on how you can act. Um, so they have a kind of moral status for sure. If um, suffering just means pain, then that's what the discussion of the first family of cases was meant to at least address. And the claim was that you think what matters is how your actions will affect the um, trajectory of an individual, whether it will make this conscious subject better or worse off. But it's very hard to tell the difference between that thought and the idea that your action will affect the distribution over time and space of suffering. And if all that matters is the latter, and maybe all that matters is the latter as it is played out over sort of certain paths in space-time, the ones that are sort of filled with organisms, yeah. um, which is consistent with the picture I was painting, then since this metaphysics doesn't imply anything weird about how that distribution is affected by our actions, it doesn't have weird ethical consequences for our actions. Um, sometimes suffering is used to mean something more than pain. Pain plus the consciousness of, this is really bad for me. So it's some, Dennett says this, that uh, animals can feel pain, but animals can't suffer. Yeah. Sort of ugly chauvinistic claim about animals, but because uh, I know some animals who can suffer. Plenty, um, but that kind of suffering does require something like the capacity for day say thought. So that would go into the second thing. Um, about the reference, so reference magnetism was just a placeholder. Yeah. Our actual uses of you know, pronouns, demonstratives, the first person pronoun, proper names and so on, maybe that massively underdetermines the referent of these things, because all our actual uses so far are compatible with all kinds of things happening in the future and in other possible worlds that we haven't considered. Um, but um, that just shows that there are constraints on reference for these things that go beyond actual occasions of use. Let whatever it is that secures relatively determinate reference for names and pronouns be uh, the thing I was calling reference magnetism. It could involve Lewisian naturalness. It could just involve um, a principle of charity applied to our dispositional uses of expressions, for all I've said. Look at all the kinds of things we're disposed to say about where you'll be in the future, what would happen to me if you did. It's a radically a charitable interpretation that makes almost all of those things false or truth valueless. The only interpretations that make almost all of them true are interpretations that take the pronouns to refer to people and not to these um, scattered things. In the example, the thing that starts off with you and then shifts to another person, that thing's not a person. It's coincident with a person here, coincident with a different person here, but because its persistence conditions are totally different from the cons persistence conditions of a person, as I was using the word, 
that thing doesn't count as a human being for sure, as a person either. So even if persons form a natural kind, those things, if, if, if there aren't any lines to be drawn at all, those things don't constitute anything like a natural reference magnet. Mm. Well, even though uh, past <laughs> post-jump, it can be just like me qualitatively, but for being miserable. Even in that case. Right, so if you have a miserable twin mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, let it be a Max Black world, perfectly symmetric universe. Um, there's you and your miserable twin over here, and there's you and your miserable twin over there, and then what happens when I snap my fingers is that there's something that coincident with you here that is afterwards coincident with miserable thing on the other side of the universe. Um, yeah, that's not a person, because he crossed space-time at the snap of a finger. Um, and you know, it, look how much work we have to do in order to introduce descriptions that clearly apply to these things. That's the hallmark of something that's relatively um, unnatural as a referent. Um, it's like Rue. We have time for one more question, maybe. Paul, again. Again. Um, so, as I, as I understand the situation or the picture, right, when we worry about the future, so when we worry whether the action we're going to take right now will bring about the sort of events we think desirable or not, we, we in a way worry about a, a subclass of these uh, many. Um, Modal profiles that right. you talked about. Right. Um, however, it seems that some of them are just more salient to us than others. And is, isn't that in virtue of what we represent as being the important causal relationships at, at, in the current world? In other words, you, you've talked a lot about moral status and, let's say, the way in which some of these things might not matter because they are not let's say, agents or conscious. But conversely, uh, I want to hear more about the way in which we think some of these um, unactualized uh, modal profiles might matter to us. Isn't it in virtue of being causally close or causally connected? Or do, do, do you see what, what I'm trying to ask? So the ones that do matter, um, so I was taking it for granted that when we ask why certain entities matter for moral purposes, the answer can't be because they're salient to us or because we care about them. Mm -hmm. um, if these things are out there and they have every claim to be cared about and we just haven't noticed them and don't happen to care about them, that wouldn't help um, if they uh, merit the kind of concern we devote to things like us. So you've got to find some feature of these things that is independent of our actual concerns that distinguishes them from us. Um, and I pointed to things like the capacity for agency or the capacity for self-concern or something like that. There are other things you could say. So the stages along the way in the life of a creature like yours exhibit massive psychological um, continuity and connectedness. Um, physical continuity and connectedness from one moment to the next and so on. So a different sort of view would hold that um, those are the things that um, get something in the game. You have to add some, if you think that animals are in one sort of car category and uh, reflective human beings have a more exalted moral status, then it's not enough to be a well-behaved worm to uh, have moral status. They have to be capacities attached to that well-behaved worm. But I was thinking that there's something in this way of thinking about th these things that is um, not in the spirit of that sort of parfidian view. When I care about what's going to happen to me, it's not comfort at all to be told that 
Um, well, your memory is going to be erased first, so the thing in the future won't be psychologically connected to you. It's not comfort to be told, you're going to be teletransported first, so the thing in the future um, won't be materially continuous with you. Um, Self-concern really is concern for yourself. And it's in the spirit of this thing to operate with a non-reductionist conception of identity over time and identity across worlds. Because, after all, these things do persist through time, not in virtue of psychological continuity or connectedness or anything like that. They just do, just as the thing is the same in another world, not because it's a similar counterpart or anything like that, but because it just is the same thing. So if identity across time is what matters to us in these cases, then it's not just the fact that for well-behaved circumstances, identity across time for us also goes with psychological and physical continuity and connectedness. But that's an alternative view. It says the things that matter morally are the things whose four-dimensional worms exhibit the right kind of internal coherence and dependence. Um, that, that view will probably confer, converge with this one mm -hmm. in, its, um, in the observation that uh, the fancy metaphysics doesn't matter for ethics, mm -hmm. but um, it'll get there in a different way. Mm -hmm. I definitely haven't thought through all the alternatives to this way of thinking about things. Thank you very much. Other questions? Okay. This is not completely well formed, Steve Diablo. Um, but so there's one way of thinking about exalted moral status where it does seem as though inability to sort of imagine your future life or kind of make plans for the future uh, um, get, gets in the way um, this, of having it. There's another picture, though, where you think, 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 of, think of it temporally first, that it's a particularly awful insult to the integrity of a self-concerned person if they were to be robbed of the ability to think of themselves. I mean, so suppose someone said, I'm, I'm going to do this kind of neurosurgery, as a result of which all your seeming eye thoughts are really going to be directed at these like <laughs> twisted other creatures. And, 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 and you don't think, uh, oh, well, we don't have to care about you anymore because you're no longer thinking about <laughs> yourself. Um, now, it could be that there's a kind of inherited uh, exalted status that, you know, how, do you, yeah. how, does, how does one decide between thinking of the failure to have day say your inability to have day say thoughts as taking you out of the game versus a further and especially cruel insult to what could have been your game or something like that. So you never <laughs> even got to, you know, I could have been a contender. I could have been a self referrer. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, I mean, if it's diachronic, if you started off as a yeah. thing fully capable of thinking about yourself, then depriving you of that capacity, that's like, you know, killing you or seriously disabling you. And that's a harm to you because you were already in the game and yeah. we've taken away something of value to you. Um, you know, one way to think about the hypothetical is we do some sort of neurosurgery and um, now suppose all your eye thoughts are about me. Um, well, one, in one picture, we've sort of, you've hooked up your body to my mind. So now, um, an eye thought in my brain becomes an eye thought in your brain, which causes your body to move. Now, it's, this is as bizarre as it gets, but now we're a, a single mind with two bodies, and one of them's over there. And that thing is still capable of thinking about itself. Um, so I need a version of the case where I wish I could really think about a thing that was kind of person-like, but whose eye thoughts were really about something else that didn't reduce to this case. Um, something that I didn't say at all um, is I, well, I asserted dogmatically that what makes you um, 
morally um, special in these ways, has something to do with your capacities. That doesn't explain how a severely disabled human being or a very young infant um, would have the same kind of moral status as you or I, as we ordinarily think. Um, now, even the, the very young infant and most severely disabled people are still capable of day-say thought. They can do things, they can move around, and so on. So you'd have to be very out of it um, not to satisfy this condition. But um, I guess I have to think, with anyone who thinks that moral status doesn't depend on species membership, but on capacities, that if you have a member of our species who really does lack all of the relevant capacities, it's got moral status by um, a kind of courtesy. Um, it's not really that your actions need to be justifiable to that entity in order to be permissible. They have to be justifiable to humanity in general or something like that. And the wrong isn't so much a wrong, a moral wrong to this thing as is an um, insult to humanity and all of us. Um, but you know, people um, down through the ages have found themselves forced to say things like, it sounds a little cold, but I think you do have to say something like that at the limit. <laughs>